Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Evenings with Ezekiel. I'm not Ezekiel. I'm uh, Pastor Joe Green, uh, pastor of Second Baptist Church in South Hadley, Massachusetts, where this Bible study originates. Uh, great to have you tonight. We are about halfway through this long Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Today we're going to look at several chapters, actually, chapters 25 through 32. Further ado, let's get right in, because we're doing a lot of chapters, eight chapters, and that's quite a bit. And you know, hopefully you read through this whole section, and we're treating this whole section, these whole eight chapters, but we're doing it in two parts. So today we're going to look at the content of these prophecies of these eight chapters and how they actually begin Ezekiel's, uh, the book of Ezekiel's turn towards hope for Israel's restoration. Uh, but next week we're going to focus on the prophecies against a, a Tyre. Okay, so Tyre was a, a, a city in Phoenicia and the reason we're going to focus on those is perhaps you're not aware, but many look at this prophet, the prophecies against Tyre as an example of unfulfilled prophecy in the Bible. And skeptics actually use this portion of the Bible to refute uh, prophecy. So I want to make sure that we spend extra time on that. So even if you hadn't heard about that, I want to equip you by going deeply into that. And that's uh, mostly, again, the prophecies of Tyre. But today, we're going to look big picture. Next week, we're going to focus on those prophecies against Tyre, which is 28 and 29, um, chapters 28 29, or maybe 27, 28. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, just a review, again, if you're new to us, uh, the book of Ezekiel was written by the prophet priest named Ezekiel, and he received visions from God around 590 B.C., while he was in exile in Babylon. So uh, the Babylonian Empire had come and taken exile, taken some of the, ca the Jewish captives exile to Babylon. And now Ezekiel was there and he started to receive visions from God. He actually saw God's glory. And he starts to proclaim the imminent doom of the rest of Jerusalem and Judah because the Babylonians would come and totally destroy all the remaining citizens in the in the city of Judah in around 586 BC. So around four years prior, Ezekiel starts to receive visions. He acts out these prophecies. He speaks these prophecies and, and basically says destruction is coming, Israel, because you've turned your back on God. And so the Babylonians will be an instrument. And we saw in chapter 24, the very previous chapter, that the siege of Jerusalem began. So that's a turning point in the book. And so the judgment is coming. But Jude, um, the Lord also revealed through Ezekiel that he's going to show grace to his people once again in the future. And so now, though, as we turn to Ezekiel chapter 25 through 32, these chapters contain prophecies against the surrounding nations. And each prophecy against each one of these surrounding nations, and we'll, we'll go through them, a prophecy against the, the country of Ammon and, and Moab and Edom and Philistia and Phoenicia. Um, each prophecy begins with, the word of the Lord came to me. And then the Lord calls out a nearby nation. Uh, God's word was di directed at these other nations, stresses that, that God is not only sovereign over Israel, but he's sovereign over all the nations. And these prophecies actually begin the book's turn towards hope. So the first half has really been more, I mean, it's been glimpses of hope, but it's mostly been prophecies about the doom is coming, uh, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, and here are the reasons why. Well, this, these prophecies begin the turn towards hope for Israel's restoration. Now, that might not sound right, but the thing is, is as Lord of all the earth, God's going to also bring justice to Israel's enemies, those surrounding nations, especially those nations around her who have mocked her and sometimes been her enemy. So that is going to, again, encourage them that God is, is uh, not singling out just Israel. Uh, he's doing something in all the nations, and he's going to restore them and therefore uh, remove all of her enemies. All right, so that's what this section, these eight chapters, really focus on is the... Um, the prophecies against the nations around Israel. Now, in the discussion guide, I had this map, and so obviously if you can look at the map on your, your phone or your computer, it's going to be better. But just to hold it up a little bit, is that um, Ezekiel starts prophecies around the surrounding nations. So here's Judah, right here, 
Okay, and um, again, this map is of, of when the, the northern kingdom of Israel and Judah actually existed, but by this time, Israel, the northern kingdom, had been deported uh, by the Assyrians a hundred years earlier, and so this area would just be sort of uh, a mix and, um, you know, referred to as Samaria. But the surrounding nations, starting with Ammon, right, that uh, Ezekiel prophesies against Ammon, and then Moab, and then Edom, and then Phil uh, Philistia, okay, and then he moves up to Phoenicia, and he's prophesying against all of these surrounding nations. And chapter Ezekiel chapter 25 uh, covers four nations. Uh, it's short prophecies against those small four small nations, uh, kind of south uh, cradling uh, Judah. And they often these nations often fought against the Jewish people, uh, but sometimes they were political allies. But whenever Israel was weak, these nations would try to take advantage of the situation. So when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, or they were destroying Jerusalem, these nations rejoiced. When some of the exiles, some of the um, Jewish people were taken exile, like Ezekiel, were taken into exile, excuse me, uh, they rejoiced. And so he's warning these nations, prophesying against them, saying that Jerusalem, um, that these nations are going to be overcome by the Babylonians, because they're just as deserving of judgment as Israel. So that's chapter 25, concentrating on those four nations. When we get to Ezekiel chapter 26, all the way through mid-chapter 28, there's a, a prophecy against Tyre and its king. So if you've never heard, I know it's kind of late, I'm tired, uh, but this isn't that. It's Tyre, the city, and that's a city of Phoenicia right here. Okay, Phoenician, you might have heard of Phoenicians. Well, Tyre is a major city in Phoenicia, and Ezekiel focuses his prophecies against Tyre and its king. And, yeah, there's three chapters all devoted. So four, chap four countries are covered in one chapter, 25, but for some reason he really focuses on Tyre with three chapters, and they all present basically the same message, that Tyre and its king is coming to an end, right? You see, it's coming to an end. So there's, uh, that's said three times in these chapters. And, and it's said in three different ways. So there's a prophecy against the nation of Tyre that it's going to fall. Then there's a prophecy against the king of Tyre, how it's going to fall. Then there's a lament. And we've talked about that genre, lament before. There's a lament for the nation uh, and city of Tyre. Then there's a lament for its king. But basically, Tyre was a very rich, prosperous, seafaring city. And it was built on an island. So it made it very resistant to sieges. So many people could not conquer it because, again, it's in the middle of an island. And when an invading nation came, people just you know went into the city walls. But they couldn't build their siege work, their earthen siege work against it because it was an island. Um, but because of that, uh, it became proud. And Ezekiel, in these chapters, he often highlights Tyre's rich trading exploits, its prosperity, to then show how far, how far it's going to fall. All right, so chapter 28 uh, especially focuses on the fall of the prince of Tyre, and his, his pride was a reason for the judgment upon him. And just a side note, you'll see some scholars talk about um, the Prince of Tyre in chapter 28 actually referring to Satan and Satan's pride and his fall from heaven. Um, and, he, you know, he fell because of his pride. Um, but that's a very debated topic, and I'm not, it's too difficult to go into it now. I don't think that's the case, but there are some scholars who say, yeah, it's sort of talking about the Prince of Tyre, but it's also talking about Satan. Um, so anyways, let's move on. At the end of Ezekiel 28, there's just like six verses that have a short prophecy against Sidon. Now, Sidon was another um, a prominent city in Phoenicia, just above Tyre. Tyre and Sidon are often paired together because they were the main cities of Phoenicia. And then this short prophecy against Sidon moves into this contrast between the dead end destinies of all these enemy nations that Ezekiel's been mentioning, that their destiny is kind of a dead end. They will end. And they contrast that with the hopeful destiny of the people of Israel. Because although Jerusalem was being destroyed at that very moment, God was not finished with his people. He would gather his people back up after exile, whereas the surrounding nations, uh, they would no longer be around to harass Israel. So, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 26 says this, uh, And they, that is the, 
the, the Jewish people shall dwell securely in it, that, that is the land, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. They shall dwell securely when I execute judgments upon all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I'm the Lord their God. So the judgment on Israel's enemies shows that Israel's God is still in control. And whereas God is going to bring those nations to an end, he will bring Israel back one day and establish them. That's the difference between those destinies. All right, and now as we turn to Ezekiel chapter 29 to 32, instead of those surrounding nations, prophecies against those surrounding nations, now Ezekiel takes up a prophecy and a lament against Egypt and its pharaoh. And much like the extended prophecy against Tyre, these chapters express the same basic message of destruction upon Egypt, but does it in different ways. So first there's a prophecy against the nation of Egypt, then a prophecy against Pharaoh. Then there's a lament for the nation of uh, Egypt, and then there's a lament for Pharaoh. And we shouldn't be too surprised, because Egypt has long been involved in Israel's history. Uh, Egypt enslaved Israel at the time of Moses. Remember, Moses took uh, Israel out of bondage in Egypt, so there's been a long history there. But in Ezekiel's particular day, uh, Egypt was actually somewhat of an ally against the Babylonians. And in fact, Egypt encouraged Israel to rebel against Babylon. And then when Israel did, Egypt turned out to be a very weak ally, not able to stand up against the Babylonians. We see this in the book of Jeremiah, too. But uh, Israel's trust in Egypt instead of God, um, it, it proved to be fatal for both nations because God gave Egypt over into Nebuchadnezzar, that's the emperor of Babylon's hands. That says, says that in chapter 29, verse 19. Um, and actually the Babylonians, not only did they take a lot of Jewish people captive, but remember they took a lot of, uh, I didn't say remember, but they also took a lot of the Egyptians captive. Um, and now, in beginning in chapter 31 and 32, Ezekiel then kind of compares the power and pride of Egypt to the Assyrian Empire. I've mentioned the Assyrian Empire a couple of times, but remember, only a few decades prior, the mighty Assyrian Empire was brought to an end by these Babylonians. Remember, the Assyrians were the ones that destroyed the northern kingdom, northern Israel, and brought them captive. Well, and Judah just barely survived, but then the Babylonians came. They destroyed the Assyrians. Now, um, likewise, the once mighty Egyptian empire will come to an end by the Babylonians, just like the Assyrians. That's what he's saying in chapters 31 and 32. And as God brings Egypt down to the grave, to the pit, to Sheol, Assyria is going to be one of the many destroyed nations kind of waiting to meet Egypt there. That's again in chapters 32, verses 18 through 32. All right, so we just went through like eight chapters in, in 15 minutes, uh, just touching on each one. And again, we're going to look more next week about the prophecies against Tyre. But again, it's always important to ask, how do we apply this? Um, you know, what, what can we take from this that could change our way of life or our thinking? And I think the, uh, the primary message of these chapters is that the nations are really a drop in the bucket. In fact, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 15, says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust of the scales. In other words, scale, dust on scales doesn't even make the scales move. And uh, the prophet Isaiah is saying all the nations are like that. And basically that is what the message of Ezekiel chapters 25 to 32 is as well. That, and, and it's so important to keep this perspective, especially when wars rage or national events can really bring us down. You know, I think of my Ukrainian friends whose country has been subject to Russian interference for many years, but especially these last few years uh, in the Donetsk region and stuff where, the, where Russia is coming. They took the Crimean, uh, you know, the Crimea away from Ukraine. I'm, I know because I've talked to them, many of them are discouraged because these nations, especially bigger nations, have power to raise an army that really can uh, wreak havoc in your own country. Uh, not only that, but sometimes your own nation can raise up, um, you know, enforce laws, raise up police that makes your life miserable. But here's the thing that it's not forever because nations come and go. I think that's one of the main messages here. So that today's enemy nation is gone tomorrow, but God's kingdom is eternal. 
And so the Israelites, hearing that God was bringing judgment to the surrounding nations by the same Babylonians that had destroyed their capital city, it actually reminded them of this truth, that wait, God's not just sovereign over our little country, he's sovereign over everything. And although Ezekiel doesn't point out, point it out, other prophets point out that Babylon would also, in turn, be judged. That yeah, the Babylon was being used by as an instrument in God's hand, but Babylon would also be judged. And they were destroyed through the Persian Empire that came after the Babylonians. But see, when you trust in God and in Christ, your citizenship is in heaven. Your citizen is your citizenship is first in the kingdom of God. And so, you can't get too low for too long. Because you're an, a, a citizen of the eternal kingdom. And, and you have a glorious father who happens to be king. And he has a wonderful transformation prepared for his people. So as the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So that whatever stage we're in now, that is kind of a pun, but uh, whether it's, it's good or bad, you know, we're going to be transformed by the power of Christ, who has authority over all things for eternity. That's what these verses are saying. So we shouldn't get too low when the nations are raging or our nation is being uh, attacked by an enemy. Um, but the converse is also true, and that is, but we also shouldn't get too high um, when your earthly nation is prospering as well, or prospering and in and, and, and power. We shouldn't get too excited about that either, because whenever a nation or a leader gets too prideful, like the Prince of Tyre, like Egypt, God can humble them in a moment. Um, and so to the Prince of Tyre, who had become such a powerful merchant and had that, you know, that island to protect him, he claimed almost godlike status. And you know, as as Gwygon says, there's always a bigger fish. And uh, and that's what got he brought a bigger fish. And with death, death is the great equalizer. So no matter how great or powerful or prosperous you are, um, you're still going to die if you're a human, if you're earth, based in the earth. That's why in Ezekiel 28.9, uh, Ezekiel says to the king of Tyre, Will you still say, I'm a god, in the presence of those who kill you? Though you are but a man and no god in the hands of those who slay you? So basically he's saying, yeah, can you really claim godlike status when, you know, your killer, your murderer is going to take your life? You're not going to be all that great then. When death comes, it's hard for a leader to claim special status, no matter how great his accomplishments. And, and the same thing is true with nations. Even the most prosperous nation has a life cycle. So we shouldn't get too hyped up if our nation or any nation is prospering. Humility is in order. Trusting in the one who is truly God of the nations. That's what we need to do. Because even the most prosperous and powerful nations come to an end. And, and that's what this section of Ezekiel really reminds us about. So don't trust in temporal earthly nations. Because the mighty Assyrian Empire was, is, is no longer. The mighty Babylonian Empire is no longer. The Persian Empire, the Roman Empire came to an end. The Soviet Union fell apart. Um, and unless Jesus returns one day, the United States of America will one day be no more, just like these other uh, uh, prosperous nations. And the point is, this, we need to make sure that we keep our eyes on being a citizen of the eternal kingdom, so that on earth we don't get too low when things are going bad in our nation or nations around us, or we don't get too high when the waves of history right, lift up our nation or pull our nation under. Um, instead, we put our feet on the rock of the eternal God and his promises. And that's what this section of Ezekiel, I think, really teaches us. So if you're in a place where you're downtrodden uh, because of the events of the world, yeah, take courage. Uh, but also, if you're prideful and, and, and too um, hyped up about uh, that, then be careful. Because, again, our true citizenship is in heaven. So put our feet on the eternal rock of God. I hope that encourages you. I hope that changes your perspective as it has mine as we look at these chapters. If you're watching us live, I invite you to click on the link to join our live Zoom discussion group. And again, if not, then I hope to see you either at our Sunday service or next Wednesday uh, and as we continue in our this series, Evenings with Ezekiel.